My Lord, what a morning. You have raised up a mighty nation and a mighty people. We are strong, proud, and yours. My Lord, my Lord, what a morning. You have brought us through the dips and hollows, up and down the streets, over the hills and mountains and through the valleys. We are strong, proud, brave, and yours. My Lord, this morning we have come to celebrate you, to affirm ourselves as images of you in all your glory and to say, yes, Lord, we are strong, proud, brave, and yours in every way. We count it all joy. If you believe it today, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank <laughs> you. 
under the sound of my voice and in the airways as you bless this service in Jesus name amen, amen. today we are so blessed and and didn't we just have a wonderful dance and the music such an amazing 
I'm always amazed at how awesome we are as a people. Um, we now have a treat for you. We are celebrating lots of amazing people in history and there's always some unsung heroes that we should celebrate. And right here in our church, we have some amazing people. And today we're gonna see um, an interview. And the first interview, we're gonna see two interviews. The first interview is going to be now and that one will be uh, Mr. Century Gamble. So give Century a big hand. And our interviewer was Miss Lenise Adams, and I think we're ready now. Yes, okay, so let's enjoy, and later the pastor will introduce another amazing person in our church. Good afternoon, my name is Lenise Adams, and I'm a member of Walters Memorial AME Zion Church. My pastor is Reverend Elvin Clayton. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing two amazing members of Walters Memorial as part of our Black History program. I. I'll interview Mr. Century Gamble, a school psychologist for Bridgeport School System. And following Mr. Gamble, I'll be interviewing Colonel Adele Hodges, a retired veteran of the United States Marine Corps. First, Mr. Gamble, before we get started, I'd like to thank you for your years of dedicated service to the Bridgeport community's children and families. You're welcome. Uh, how many years, Mr. Gamble, have you been a school psychologist? I've been employed with the Bridgeport Board of Ed for about 35 years. 35 years. And becoming a school psychologist and, su and being successful as it was a great accomplishment for you? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. What college did you attend and what year did you, what degree did you get? I attended the first three years. I attended a branch, um, branch campus of the University of South Carolina in Sumter. There I received my associate's degree. For my senior year, I went to the main campus in Columbia where I received a Bachelor of Arts degree. I took about a year off, then I went back and came here to Bridgeport and attended the University of Bridgeport where I obtained my master's degree and then um, my sixth year degree. Great. Now what challenges did you encounter in your journey towards a higher education? My, ma my major challenges occurred during my elementary, middle school, and high school years in South Carolina. During that time, it was sort of the height of racism, where African American or people of color were viewed as good athletes, but they weren't viewed as comparable to our co white counterparts in the classroom in, in terms of academic ability. Um, I, there was a lot of friction um, during those times and especially when it was our senior year to graduate where it was myself and another white young lady had the almost exact same grade point average of 93 point something and in behind the scenes you know I was unaware at the time but behind the scenes there was a lot of going back and forth and bickering and fighting about who should be you know valedictorian or salutatorian of your senior class uh, one of the arguments was the um, young lady took basic, you know, chemistry, basic math, and those kinds, whereas I was taking more college prep courses, and they, you know, some felt that I should be, you know, the higher average because of my classes. So, and other challenges were, you know, normal, how you're going to pay for it, how do you balance work, and those kinds of things that have a social life at the same time. The social life is important, right? Yeah. All right. Now, what was your first job after getting your degree and certification? I was one of the lucky ones because the same year I graduated from the University of Bridgeport, I was hired by the Bridgeport Board of Ed. And what were some struggles for you being a black male school psychologist? One of the, I think, struggles early on was being viewed as a professional. You know, sometimes they, uh, they viewed us as not equal in some instances. And, other t and later, I found that my caseloads tended to be a little bit heavier. I got sent to the more challenging um, schools. You know, early on, you would have conversations. An example is um, there was, at one time, they housed all of the students with emotional disturbance in one building and they were supposed to rotate between myself and two other of my colleagues. 
And when it got to me, it seemed like the rotation stopped. So, but that's, you know, part of the job. And I've had one of my supervisor told me blunt to my face, I'm sending you to this particular school because you're a black male. You know, she would say that I've sent other females there and it was always a challenge. It was always a problem, you know, with the building administrator. So you're going there because you're a black male. And other parts of that is, is the caseload gets heavy. I'm sure you have experienced many changes in school policy, some renewed, removed, and things added. What one thing would you bring back if you had the opportunity to? Something that you believe would benefit all students? Quite a few years ago, there was a program called co-location where the Bridgeport Board of Ed partnered with um, community agencies to address the needs of families in the communities. Um, families that were referred were brought up at the meetings and we would sit down as a group and talk about what does this family need. Um, those parts that related to education, um, the Bridgeport Board of Ed was responsible for, and not only that, certain individuals were identified as the persons who would be responsible for that part. Say, for example, if evaluations were needed, you know, myself might be, you know, rep responsible for certain testing and other parts maybe go to a special ed teacher for um, academics. If the family needed housing, there was a person responsible as a caseworker who may oversee everything. And if they needed housing, there was a person responsible for that. If they needed furniture, there was someone responsible for that. If there were appliances that they needed to get to um, different um, meetings, different appointments in the community, there were people appointed to make sure that those things happened. Oh, it sounds like a great program. It was. And thank you, Mr. Gamble, for all of your years of service to our Bridgeport Public School community. You're welcome. Might we prepare our hearts for the Holy Word. The scripture will be coming from Joshua chapter 4, verses 18 through 24. Hear these words. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the water of Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up, to went up from Jordan and camped in Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea. When he dried it up before us until we had crossed over, he did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord, your God. May the Lord add a blessing for the hearer and readers of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Dear Heavenly Father, as we rise to the new challenges of each and every day, please be with us, Lord Jesus. Continue to go before us and prepare the place, Heavenly Father. Straighten out the crooked, the crooked paths, Lord Jesus, that we will stay on the path of righteousness for your name's sake, Heavenly Father. Fill us up, Lord Jesus, fill us up today with your Holy Spirit that we can continue to win souls for you, Lord Jesus. Wherever we go, Heavenly Father, wherever we go, 
Let your love go with us, Heavenly Father. Let your joy be with us. Let your peace ascend among each and every one of us as we spread the goodness and the good news of you, Lord Jesus. Be with us, Heavenly Father. Be with us in each and every day, Heavenly Father. Use us, Heavenly Father, for your upbuilding of your kingdom. Let your word come alive in us as we speak to one another. Yes. Let us speak with the love and the agape love that you give to us, Heavenly Father. Treating our brothers and sisters as you first loved us. And we say thank you, Lord. Thank you. We thank you for loving us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for protecting us. We thank you for just covering each and every one of us today, Lord Jesus, that we were able to come out and worship your holy name one more time, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for that. We come to worship you today, Lord Jesus, because you are worthy. You are worthy of all our praise, Heavenly Father, and we say thank you, Lord. We can't praise you enough, Heavenly Father, for the things that you've done for us. But you said in your word, if the prayers go up, the blessings come down. And we thank you right now for all the prayers that you've done in our lives, all the prayers that you, all the blessings that you've given us, Lord Jesus. And we say thank you, Lord. For we know some days we're not worthy, but you saw fit to continue to bless us, continue to cover us, continue to watch over us. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you, God, for all the things that you've done. Continue to be with us, Lord Jesus. Bless the preacher of this hour today, Lord Jesus. Touch him right now, Lord Jesus. Touch him from the crown to the soles of his feet. And more importantly, Lord, as he pours out, we ask that you pour into him, Lord Jesus, for there is a word from on high. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Bless our pastor, Lord Jesus, who continues to not only preach, but teach. And we thank you for him. Continue to cover him. Continue to anoint him. Continue to fill him up, Lord Jesus. And bless our First Lady as she continues to be in the vineyard, winning souls for you, for Christ. Continue to fill her up, Heavenly Father. Continue to comfort her heart, Lord Jesus. Be with each and every one of us, Lord Jesus, under the sound of my voice and in the airways, Heavenly Father, for we need a touch from you. Just touch us right now, Heavenly Father. Bless the music ministry. Bless the ushers. Bless the technicians, the media. Bless all the ministries that are under the sound of Walter's Heavenly Father. Bless them. Bless the churches that are planted in your name, Heavenly Father. Bless the Amy Zion denomination from the bishop down to the buds of promise. And we will forever give your name the glory, the honor, and all the praises that are due to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
was two minutes from the church. Pastor Clayton called me, messed up my GPS. <laughs> said, where are you? He said, you know, we start at 11 o'clock. I said, Pastor, there's been some difficulty on the road, and I'll be there in a minute. And when I came in, I saw this wonderful assembly. And then they brought me up to the pulpit, and I said, I'm home. And then I saw Mrs. Clayton coming in. <laughs> and I said, I'm not late. <laughs> the other story that I like to tell is about this cat who died and, 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 and went to heaven. And the Lord said to him, uh, what, what can I do for you to make heaven more comfortable for you? He said, well, while I was down on earth, I had, um, I had to sleep on the hard floor. I didn't get much to eat. Uh, I was living in poverty. He said, what I would like for you to do, Lord, is to give me a, a soft, comfortable pillow to sleep on. And the Lord said, all right, I'm going to give that to you. A few days later, some mice died and they went to heaven. And the Lord said to them the same thing. And they told their story. They said that, that the cats were always trying to catch them. So they were always running, always on their feet. And, and, and the women with their brooms would beat after them and they were always having to flee. They were saying, when we get to, what you could do for us is just give us some roller skates. Lord said, no problem. You got it. The Lord went by one day and he saw the cat on the pillar. He said, how are you doing? And the, and the cat said, I'm doing wonderfully. He said, but, but, but what we really want to thank you for is for those meals on wheels that you <laughs> saw. In the fourth chapter of the book of Joshua, when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan, which was no easy feat, when they got to the other side and, and, the, and the, after the waters had receded and had started to surface again, Joshua would look back and he said to them, he said, I want each man from each tribe to take a stone, 12 stones. And I want you to make here a little monument so that when your children shall ask you what these stones mean. And I want to paraphrase it by simply saying that the Lord has made a way out of no way. We're living in a time when our young people have no sense of history or their self-worth. I'm not talking about pants that are hanging down. I'm not talking about tattooed bodies, but I'm talking about minds that don't realize their true potential. Minds that have never really understood their history. I'm looking at 900,000 black men who are in jail today. I'm looking at 55% of young black men who don't graduate from high school, who live their lives on the street not knowing really who they are. I'm talking about Nick Cannon. Young men having babies, being daddies, but don't know how to be a father. Mm -mm. I'm talking about a systemic effort upon society to weaken us as a nation and to weaken us as a people. 
Joshua knew he was going into the new land. And you know when you're going into new lands, you, you always find that there's already somebody there to change the way you speak. He remembered how in Babylon, how the Hebrew boys got new names. He remembered how they tried to take from them their God. And he said to these Israelites, when your children shall ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them this is your history. Tell them that your history didn't start here. Your history started with God. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion. And when our captives asked of us a song, they cried, Oh, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? By the rivers of the Mississippi. By the rivers of the Hudson. The Naugatuck. The James River. We sat down and wept when our captives asked of us a song. In New York City, when I pastored, I pastored a group in, in Harlem. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, it, it's, it's nothing like being in Harlem. Harlem is like the Mecca of the black world. There's your Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. Harlem is, is the place where cooking is cooking. Harlem is the place where we have our, it is our capital. But in that city, crime runs high. In that city, black youth die every day because of drugs, violence, and systemic evil. So I decided I was going to do a, a, a program, and I've talked to your pastor about the program called Boys to Men, where we would teach them their history. Come on now. We'd teach them who they were. We, we're going to have a program that, that said to them, you don't need to be in a gang because you got a family here that loves you. I remember having the bright idea of asking them to, uh, on Father's Day, to write a letter to their father. And in my mind, I said, you know, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to make them authors in a book. I'm going to have them, you know, writing these wonderful stories about their dads. And when I looked at the pages, half of them couldn't write couldn't read. And when they talked about their dads, out of 16, only one said that his father lived at home. The other one said, oh, he lives down the street, or I never met him, or he's in prison, or he's in jail. And my heart just broke on the inside. I realized then that this evil is systemic. The scientists, he doesn't want our young people to know their history. Because if they knew their history, they would be a different people. Public schools don't want our young people to know their history. When I was in public schools, they had about two paragraphs about black people. And they called them slaves. And you know what? I thought they were talking about somebody else. I didn't know they were talking about me. What do these stones mean? If Joshua was to come back and to ask you, have you taught your children what these stones mean? You know, you, you, you don't have to look for the public schools to teach your children. Yes. You can teach your children these stories yourself. Oh, come on. You know that Carter G. Woodson was the father of black history. He wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. You know Van Sertiman talked about we came here before Columbus. Come on now. You know that W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talented 10th. Dr. Ben talked about the black man's contribution to the major Western religions. And the Rome Bennett before the Mayflower, yeah. we didn't come here on the Nina, the Pinta, nor the Santa Maria. Yeah. But we came here on slave ships called the Good Ship Fortune. We came here on slave ships called the Good Mary. We came here on slave ships called Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Slave ships. 
Tell them, you, tell them, tell them the history. Yes, sir. Tell them how far we've come. Tell them that, 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 that on these slave ships we were put in the hull of the ships, packed like sardines. That the ships that went across the Atlantic, that the, that the sharks followed the ships all the way to shore. Because there were mothers who rather than see their children born in slavery, would put their children overboard the ships. And on those ships, to justify their inhumanity to us. They said we were, we were hewers of wood and drawers of water. To express their inhumanity, to show the world that they had some humanity, they made these, these demonized ways of looking at us. Oh, it ain't nothing but a nigga. Ain't nothing but cattle. Nothing but an animal, never meant to be anything. He, 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 he can't have, he can't be a father, he's a stud. She can't be a mother because she's a mammy and a maid and a mistress. They brought us to these shores from where Reverend Clayton was just a few weeks ago uh, at the doorway of no return. Because when you got to that doorway, and you went through that doorway down to the ships, you knew that there was no way for you to come back. And so we landed on these shores. And it's really amazing how this story goes because there were indentured servants here. And they could work and be free and have some humanity. But they, they took us and made us perpetual slaves. The Indians couldn't do it. The work was too hard. The sun was too hot. So they shipped them on that trail of tears. Yeah. They took the land for beads and trinkets and sent them to Oklahoma, where many of them died on that torturous journey there. But we survived. Hallelujah. Yeah. We survived. And when we talk about our history, let me just make, make this very clear. You know, we, we talk about Negro history and black history, but let me say this to you. Our history doesn't start here. Our history starts in Africa. We, you know, when, when, when the Israelites were in Babylon, they weren't called Babylonians. When they were in Egypt, they weren't called Egyptians. Because their history didn't start where they ended up. Their history started with God. Their history started in Africa. God had kissed that continent, y'all. Yeah. Talk, about, Talk it. about the Come Euphrates and the, and the Tigris River that you find in the book of Genesis. And when you look at Dr. Leakey's work about uh, Lucy and the oldest fossils known to man, you, he'll tell you that the oldest fossils known to man are African and that all of us, white, black, green, yellow, brown, we're all African. All African. Yes, sir. God looked down at that African dirt, and, and some said it was dirt, and some said it started to be dust, and he started kicking it around, and he picked up a little of that dust, and he looked at it, and he breathed into it, and man, woo, became a living being. Come on, now. Come on, oh, our now. history. Come on, now. Start here in America. Our history started in Africa. You know, I was almost grown before I realized who I was. No, because really, I started out colored. And then someone said, no, you're not colored. You Negro. I said, okay, I'll be the Negro. Then they said, no, you're not Negro, you black. And that, that surprised me because, you see, we were taught early that black was ugly. Black was evil. Black was no good, but now, Jane Brown said, we black and proud. <laughs> they used to say it like this. If you're white, you're all right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. That's right. That was it. They said we had no religion. 
And that's, you know, I don't believe there's any people on the world or in this world who has no religion. But you see, they, 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 wouldn't, let lot, they wouldn't let let us read or write. Now, we, the Africans could write in their language, but, but here they, they couldn't either read nor write. So their stories couldn't be written. And they wouldn't allow them to tell their stories. They said they, 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 they were a beast, and so they, they couldn't get baptized. They, they, were, they were not fully human. They were only three-fifths of men, so their marriages were neither legal nor binding. And yet, even from the moment they brought us over on the slave ship, somebody realized that this was a people that God had made in his own image. Amen. Somebody said they heard them humming downstairs. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Somebody needs you, Lord. Come by here. The Israelites could not sing the Lord's song in a strange land. But you know something? We did sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Even though they told us we couldn't have church, we went down to the bulrushes and we, we had church in the open field. We looked up and sang over my head. I hear music in the air. I know there must be a God somewhere. Down, down, down south. On the banks, they would sing, steal away to Jesus. And even though they were beaten and bruised and brutalized, sun up to sundown, they could sing, trouble don't last always. Sometimes it looked like they beat everything out of them. And when they could look back and see where they came from, they, they, they realized how far away they were from their homeland, from grandma and grandpa, from all of their history. And they say, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. Beat them so bad that everything in them was out of them. And they sang, sometimes I feel like a feather in the air. A long way from home. The slave masters would tell us in, in, in their history that the slaves were happy-go-lucky. Oh, they get so happy. They got three meals a day. Oh, come on. They happy. They got, they got the leftovers from the master's table. They were happy. They never had a troubling day at all. And that's how they kept the lie and perpetuate the lie. And America today wants to continue to perpetuate that lie. They don't want you to tell your story. That's why public schools say, you know what, it may be offensive. If you tell my little white Betty and Johnny and Susie that, that your grandparents and great-grandparents were slaves and that they were beaten and that they, they were like strange fruit hanging on trees. Oh, we can't tell, we can't tell little Johnny that there were separate water fountains and that you had to ride the back of the bus and that you couldn't eat inside. You know, when we went south, I remember going south from, from Waterbury, and, and we were in the car, and we had sandwiches and everything, chicken sandwiches, the grease all wrapped up in it, a piece of white bread, and, and I thought we were going on a picnic. I didn't know we couldn't stop, but we had to, we had that, we had to eat in the car because we, we couldn't stop and eat at any of the white restaurants on the way down south. They wanted the world to believe that slavery was something. And Donald Trump has helped. He said he wanted to make America great again. And, then, and people were saying, yes, we want to make it great again. And I kept thinking, they, they want to go back to the plantation. They want us to go back to slavery. Because you see, we made America great. Yeah. 
We, 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 we made Cotton King. We made R.J. Reynolds rich. We built the White House, and look at the irony. We built the White House, and we went from the outhouse to the White House. Work it out, Tiger. Work it out. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing, our story and our history. They said that we, were, we, we, we enjoyed every minute of it. I don't think so. And if you really look at the other history, when, when, when you look at uh, Reverend um, Denmark V.C., when, when you look at Reverend uh, uh, Nat Turner, when, 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 when you look at Reverend John Brown, when you look at all of these men who fought and gave their lives for the quest of freedom, they fought because they knew that slavery was wrong, it was evil, and it was inhumane. And I want to tell you today that that slavery still exists today. The same law enforcement agency, they had to bring slaves back to the plantation to be beaten and brutalized and murdered. That same system exists today with impunity, with impunity. What do we tell our children? Joshua was really saying to them, uh, Tell your children that, that, that we were slaves in Egypt. He was saying to those Israelites, tell your children that, that God somehow made a way out of no way. Yeah. Yeah. Tell your children that when the Egyptians followed us down to the sea when we were between a rock and a hard place, God opened up the Red Sea oh, yeah. and brought us across on dry land. When your children ask you what these stones mean, tell them that through the wilderness when there was no food, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. He said, down manna. Tell them that when his enemies came up against Israel, God put a fence all around them. When your children shall ask you what these stones mean, you tell them. Tell them what our parents taught us. You see, this is what our parents taught us. Our parents taught us that as long huh, as we lived uh -huh. under their roof, <laughs> Come on. We, we, we're going to church. Yeah. If it wasn't an option, we, we were going to church. Yeah. They wouldn't let us have church, but our parents said, no, there ain't, ain't no choice here. You're going to Sunday school. You're going to Bible study. You're going to sing in the choir. You're going to be respectful of your elders. Yes, sir. Oh, our parents were tough. Be home for the street light. Come home. You talk about the Board of Education? My daddy had the Board of Education in his hand. We grew up, I grew up in the ghetto on Orange Street. I think my brother was somewhere near there. And, and, and you know what? I didn't realize that it was a ghetto until I got to college. I couldn't spell ghetto <laughs> until I got to college. And we grew up poor. Didn't know we were poor. Didn't know we were poor. I tell people all the time, I, I tell them, I say, you know, we had, we had an Italian chef and a black cook, Uncle Ben. And Chef Boy R.D. <laughs> Christmas time, our, our young people are so spoiled. Christmas time, we would have a little uh, stocking, maybe three, and they would have an orange, some nigger toes. <laughs> some nuts, and some hard candy. And we were glad to get it. Under the Christmas tree, if we, we always got one thing. It was hardly ever that we saw more than one thing. Because we were poor, and we, we didn't know. Uh, 
Hmm. My brother told the story once. He said at school they had asked to have secret Santa or, or, or exchange gifts with the students. And so he said he went to Woolworths and he bought a, a little watch. Cost him ten dollars. Wasn't supposed to spend more than five, and he gave it. And then he said, when he got his gift, it was a ruler. And he said, "What am I going to do with a ruler?" And he said uh, he was a little upset about that. He was a little angry with that. And he said, so one day the little boy invited him to his house. Not long after, he said, when he went in, he looked and they, they, they didn't have a tree because they couldn't afford one, and there were no presents under the tree. And then he said he started to feel. How, how ashamed he was because God had blessed him and he didn't really need any other blessing. His blessing was being a blessing to somebody else. Yeah. If I can help somebody yeah. as I travel along, if I can share somebody. Oh, your pastor don't want me preaching too long. Let me, let me slow down. Let me slow down. Let me slow down. Sorry. Let me slow down. He told me, he said, y'all on the time. Thing. And you know what? I looked in here when I got here for the clock and I couldn't find it. <laughs> couldn't find it. They wouldn't let us read, write. But God built up schools like Howard and Fisk and Livingstone and, and Meharry for us to learn. They wouldn't let us vote. But our forefathers, in spite of poll tax and slave codes, Right. And, and beatings and lynchings, they went out and marched and they, and, 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 and they stood the test of time, the test of time. That's what I call standing your ground. Yeah. When our children shall ask us, I hope that we can look back and say to them that we can point to those stones, to those lynching trees. I hope we can point back to those who gave their lives that we, we could vote and here we are, won't even vote. Here we are. What will we tell our children? You can tell them that Fred Douglas said that without, without, there is, without a struggle, there can be no progress. You can tell your children that, that Langston Hughes said, Life for me ain't been no crystal stair, so don't you stop on the stair, but you keep on climbing and going in the dark where there ain't been no light. You can tell them. The Dr. King said, walk together, children. Don't get weary. There's a great camp meeting 